Chapter 3 of Beowulf. This is on page 396 of your textbook. Grindel's mother invades Herod and murders Hrothgar's best friend. Beowulf plans to kill the giant. Deep within the misty marshland of the moor, and doomed to dwell in Grendel's dark and dreary den, lived the joyless giant's mighty mother. Ordinary men had loathed Grendel, but his mother had dearly loved him, and so, when death, that dreaded destiny, took Grendel's heathen life, her mother's heart flooded with surging sea swells of sorrow and rage. And it came to pass that, when the sun, heaven's jewel, had glided over the land, and the bright heavens had darkened with the shadows of dusk, the mournful mother left her lonely lair in the marshy borderland, and shielded by the darkness and mist, this shadow walker, ghastly and grim, strode forth upon silent feet toward the hall of heroes, that gold-gleaming treasure house. Her mother's heart was intent on invading that bright hall of bold-hearted men, for there her son had met his dreadful destiny. There he had received the war wounds that had doomed him to death. Grendel's mother found it easy to enter the tower-tall, timbered meat hall, for no one feared that she would come, but she stepped softly into the hall of heroes, and there she found a band of bold-hearted war comrades. At the sight of the Spear Danes, a sea swell of hatred surged forth in her mother's heart. The mead from their feast had flooded the bodies and dulled the minds of the bright Danes, but they were not as yet asleep. And seeing Grendel's mighty mother step into their hall, the mind and heart of every warrior flooded with a surging sea swell of terror. But the bright Danes told themselves that they were bold of heart and strong in strife, and that they could trust their blood-hardened, sharp-bladed battle-swords and their shining lindenwood shields. And they comforted their minds with the fact that this giant, mighty as she appeared to be, could not harm them, for she was a woman, and women were much weaker, more fearful, and far less fierce in fighting than any man. And these thoughts spurred the Spear Danes to take some action. And so, they grabbed their war weapons and prepared to attack the giant. But in their haste to harm the wondrous woman, they forgot to put on their hard war helmets and their ring-meshed battle shirts. Despite their muddled minds, God wove good fortune for the Ring Danes, for their movement signaled danger and daunted the mourning mother. Swift as a warrior's sword stroke, her mind and heart flooded with a surging sea swell of fear for her destiny, and in its wake her war fury abated, and all thought of avenging her son's death, death wound fled. Now she only longed to save her own life. And so, that mighty mother seized only one warrior, the closest Dane. She held him in a grasp that was stronger than the storm wind, and then she bit into his flesh with her frightful teeth, giving him a gruesome death wound. At last, clutching the man's corpse, she turned to run from the hall, but she spied Grendel's gruesome shoulder, arm, and iron-nailed hand beneath the high, horn-gabled roof. And so she reached up and seized it too. Then she departed, disappearing into the darkness. The sound of the Spear Dane's heart-rending cries suddenly awakened Hrothgar. Swift as a warrior's sword stroke, the old treasure-giving king, war king, went forth to his high, horn-gabled hall. And there he heard that a second frightful giant, a woman, had come uninvited into his meat hall, and she had savagely killed his dearest friend. The news crushed the king's spirit, and his heart flooded with a surging sea swell of sorrow, for the death-doomed Dane had been his beloved hearth friend, his most trusted counselor, and his bold-hearted war comrade, and he was a far-famed warrior. And so, as soon as bright daylight again shone forth over the land, Hrothgar summoned Beowulf and his war geats to the Hall of Heroes. The treasure-giving war king then unlocked his word hoard. Beowulf, my heart floods with grief and sorrow, he declared, for, after we left Herod, another joyless giant, a woman, invaded that bright hall of bold-hearted men, he declared, and she gave a Dane, a man who was dear to me, a gruesome death wound. Now, I have heard tales of her, some told by country folk, some told by counselors, hearth friends, and war comrades in my own hall. They would speak of two frightful folk, ghastly and grim shadow walkers who lurked in the lonely borderland <clears throat> during the day the mist shielded them and at night the darkness of the murky moorland shrouded them 
these joyless giants seemed drawn to the dwellings of happy Dane folk. They would come near the outskirts of farm folk, and they would stand there, silent and still. Shielded as they were by the mist, it was hard to get a clear view of them. But the larger one seemed to be a giant of a woman. The other was younger and misshapen, but still, he was a giant of a man. The old folk had named him Grendel, and bold-hearted Dane folk often peered into the murky mists for some sight of his father, but they never saw a third shadow walker. Those who spoke of them said the joyless ones lived in the lonely marshland of the moor. A few, a few fearless folk even dared to follow their trail. Where it wove good fortune for them, and so they lived to tell of it, and this is what they told. At first, the footpath takes folk through the woods, but then it travels across the moorland, murky and wild, loathsome and lonely. It leads on to a high headland, and there peril awaits folk on all sides, for the path is rope-thin and rock-strewn. It twists and turns through the frightful marshland which, it, with its treacherous mist and mud. It runs past rugged ravines, by wild wolf slopes, and along the sheer-cut and lofty wind-swept cliffs. It climbs high into the hills, and it crosses steep, rough-hewn rock slopes. It touches many a water serpent's cave and many a monster's lair. At last, the path comes to the place where a foaming mountain stream flows down a steep rock slope. It gathers strength and speed as it plunges over the rocks, becoming a terrifying torrent, and it rushes over the cliff wall in a great waterfall. And below, at the base of the cliff, the floodwaters form a lonely lake, dark and dreary, that is surely haunted by evil spirits. There, the frightful floodwaters sink beneath the muddy marshland and disappear into unknown depths beneath the earth. But those who have seen that loathsome lake have seen sea monsters frolicking there. And so, the floodwaters must flow beneath the headland and empty into the surging sea flood. There, woodland fir and pine trees lean gloomily out from the rough-hewn rocks of the cliff, casting their dark and dismal shadows upon the floodwaters. The lake itself is a frightful sight, for once the bright heavens darken with the shadows of dusk, its floodwaters burn with furious flames. And when the storm wind stirs up another up unwelcome weather, the, and daylight turns dark, its flood waters bubble and boil, and a murky mist rises into the heavens. No one knows the depth of that dark, dreaded marshland, with its lonely lake of frightful flood waters. Even the stalwart stag, that roaming heather stepper who depends upon its horn strength for safety, will stop at the edge of the cliff wall upon the brink of that marshland. When chased by deer hounds, it gladly chooses to give its life to the hunter, for it knows better than to leap into that loathsome lake with its frolicsome sea monsters in the hope of saving its life. And so, Beowulf, once again only you can help us. For of all warriors, you are the most bold of heart and strong in strife, and you have become the shield and sword of the Dane folk. That giant of a woman who invaded Herod and killed my comrade must be Grendel's mighty mother for surely there is no other. And she took small ple pleasure in her savage deed, for her goal was to avenge the death wound the bright Danes had given her son. She knows nothing of weather deeds. And so she took a life for a life. But that cannot be the end of it, for I must now take a life for a life as well. I must avenge the death of my trusted counselor and beloved comrade. And so, Beowulf, I charge you with the greatest of challenges, and I hope you will dare to do it. Kill Grendel's mighty mother. Her wild, windswept, and lonely land is not far off. Go there and seek her in her dark and dreary den. For, ghastly and grim, she guards the depths that lie beneath the frightful floodwaters of that loathsome lake. Go there and slay her. Do this deed for me, and I will reward you with a trove of gracious gifts, age-old treasures and twisted gold. So the treasure-giving war king spoke. And to his word hoard, Beowulf replied, You are a wise king, my lord, and so put aside your sorrow. It is better to avenge the death of your friend than to mourn over long for him. Where it always weaves as it must, and soon or late, death, that dreaded destiny, takes the life of every man. So the warrior who can should win honor and glory before death takes his life. Then, when his life comes to an end, his good name will live on after him. And so, my lord, quick as the wind, let us seek Grendel's footprints, 
for they are blood-stained, and surely his mighty mother has chosen to take the same path. If we leave soon, that path should be plain to see, for the sun, that bright candle of the world, is shining, and it has just begun to glide over the land. I promise you that no shelter will protect Grendel's mighty mother from my blood-hardened, sharp-bladed battle-sword. For wherever that wondrous woman hides, I will find her. Even if she takes refuge in the heart of the earth, or in the high mountain woodland, or at the bottom of the surging sea-flood, I will find her. And then, my blood-thirsting battle-sword will sing its greedy war-song. And strong as that mighty mother is, its savage stroke will give her a gruesome death-wound. Just be patient this day, my lord. So Beowulf spoke, and Hrothgar thanked God that the hero from the Geatland was the shield and sword of the Spear Danes. The old war king then called for his horse, for he would join Beowulf and his bold-hearted war comrades as they searched for Grendel's mighty mother. King Hrothgar rode in state, accompanied by a band of shield-bearers on foot. And so it came to pass that Beowulf, King Hrothgar and their bold-hearted war comrades traveled through the woods and across the moorland, murky and wild, loathsome and lonely. Danger greeted them on all sides of the high headland, and the rope-thin footpath was filled with peril. At last, the bold-hearted old war king dismounted, and he and his band of war comrades went forth to the edge of the cliff wall. Suddenly Hrothgar spied the severed, blood-bathed head of the man who had been his trusted counselor and beloved comrade. It was lying, like one of the rocks, at the edge of a steep rock slope. Beowulf had advised them well, for Grendel's mighty mother had taken this path across the moorland, bearing the body of the best of Hrothgar's men. The king and the war comrades stood silent and still at the sight. Then they approached the blood-bathed head and every heart flooded with surging sea-swells of grief and sorrow to see the destiny of that far-famed warrior. At the edge of the cliff wall they looked over the rough-hewn rocks to the muddy marshland that lay far below. It was seething with grisly gore, and the frightful floodwaters of its loathsome lake, lonely but for sea-monsters that frolicked there, were surging and swirling and bubbling and boiling with fire-hot blood. In silence, the king and the two companies of war comrades sat down and watched the scene below. Strange sea serpents were swimming here and there, and savage sea dragons, which grieved seafarers upon the, whole, the whale road by attacking their ring-proud ships, were resting upon the flat surfaces of rocks that protruded from the headland slope. Then the warriors blew a blaring battle song upon their war horns. The sudden sound startled the sea serpents, and they all swam away.